All right, I'd like us to begin by going to Mark 12, and we're going to read from verse 30 and verse 31. A very well-known passage. I know that all of you, like me, are, are seeking for a higher experience in Christ. And I, I believe that all of you, like me, want an answer to the question that we always ask ourselves. Why is it that sometimes Christianity works? And sometimes it does not seem to work. Why is it? Does God put the pressure on me, a poor little human being, to become better? Is God expecting me to pull myself out of the mud? Why is it that it doesn't work? If we say God has blessed us and God has enabled us, why is it that sometimes it doesn't work? This is, I want to look at it today and, and see if we can come to, to grips with it in a very practical way. And um, I hope we all can understand, including these young people in front. Because I would hope that all of you also have a desire to be what God wants you to be. I know from my memories of when I was 17, 16, 15, I know that there are a thousand things that, that affect your mind at that age. And least of all is religion. But I, I know that you all are aware of God. And you all have an understanding that God has a demand on your life. And I believe you want to serve Him. I believe we all want to go to heaven. I believe we all want to become what God wants us to be. So I hope you'll, you'll give me a, your best attention. Keep the children as quiet as possible, please. All right, the verse says... <coughs> it's Mark 12, verses 30 and 31. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. I'd like to ask you to consider a question. Why is it that there is no other commandment greater than these? And in fact, the first one, in another place, Jesus says this is the first and the great commandment. It's the great commandment and it's like, <coughs> it's like Christ is saying, if you get this right, everything else will fit into place. I want you to consider that for a moment. That You see, you see, Britannia, if you find a key for the door and you open the door and inside is everything you ever needed, all you need to do is look for the key. Don't look for the things you want. Look for the key. Because once you get the key, everything is yours. It's like Jesus is giving us a key. And he says, this is the first and a great commandment. Everybody in here who is challenged by the question, why does my Christianity sometimes not work? Why is it that I'm not a Christian? Why is it that I don't want to be a Christian? Maybe in this, in this passage, you can find an answer somewhere. The great commandment is that you must love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I know the questions that come up, so we're going to look at some of them. What does it mean to love God? Now, <clears throat> because my time is short, I'm not going to take comments from you, right? I, I wanted to ask a question, and I wanted to see what you would say, but I wanted to think of a question. What does it mean to love God? Now, when I was young, and sentimental and silly like some of you. I thought that love meant a nice feeling in your bosom. When you went crazy and all you could think about was going to visit this person. I'm not saying this is not a part of love. But I realize as I grow older and as I'm studying the Bible that if this is all you know of love, your love is not going to work. You know this? When you're a young person and you fall into that kind of love, you notice how easily you fall out of it and into that same kind of love with somebody else. The older ones will remember. You're in love with somebody for three weeks. Three blazing weeks when nothing else is in your mind. Sometimes it extends to a year. But it, it, it continues until you find somebody else that catches your eye and the same feeling and emotion is there. That kind of love is not the kind of love that God is emphasizing here. That may be an aspect of love, but it is a lesser part of love. Do you understand? 
I know that from my perspective and my, my experience in life. When I hear a young person come and say, I'm in love this, with this person. I can't live without this person. I need to stand back and say to this person, please don't believe your words. I was speaking to somebody in Europe and he was telling me that this girl that he was interested in is perfect in every way. I said, man, I thought a big man like you would know better than that. When I started showing him the faults, he said, well, I see them, I see them. But his mind was so obsessed with the person that he had to give me that kind of, of words. He's perfect in every way. When you say somebody is perfect in every way and you're not talking about God, you're not seeing the truth. You're blinding yourself and that kind of approach is dangerous because when you don't see the truth, you get yourself into, into things that cause trouble afterwards. You need to see the truth from the beginning that you're going with your eyes wide open. I'm sure all the people in here who, there are some divorced people here, some people who broke up relationships, you know I'm telling the truth. When you were doing the thing, you did not see the full truth. You only saw pieces of the truth and you blinded your eyes to the rest. So we need to acknowledge and accept everything in a reasonable way infatuation and emotion are not safe things to use as a foundation for what we do. You understand? So when the Bible says love God with all your heart, I'm asking is God saying you must have an emotion or a feeling? Maybe. But that cannot be everything. So, in fact, maybe I should just write it here. Emotion. And what we are looking at is, what is love? So young people, if you don't get anything else today, I hope you get this. If emotion and feeling is what you are looking for when you talk about love, think again. And I'm going to explain fully why this is so dangerous as we continue. Is it mental appreciation? Does it have to do with your mind and your intellect and your, your rational thinking? Is that involved in loving somebody? <coughs> we'll come back to that. Is it a principle which determines how I approach life? Is love all of these things? Let me write down mental appreciation. And principle. As we go along, I'll define these a little better. But look at those things. Some of those things, they don't appeal to the heart as such. For example, principle. Principle sometimes is difficult. Sometimes it gets you into hard places. For example, you're with a group of friends. And your friends say, let's go have a drink. You don't drink. You want to. Because you don't want to disappoint your friends, right? Or maybe you remember the taste of how the drink tastes. But principle now comes into play. And principle says what? Don't. So principle is cutting across feeling and emotion, right? Is this an aspect of love? Sometimes a man may go out, a married man or somebody who's engaged, and he sees a beautiful lady. And she's, she's, she's giving him the command, right? She's, she's, she's attractive and she's, she's inviting him. His feelings are getting away, right? His heart is racing and his body and his feelings are responding. What does he do? Does he call this, deal with this love? Or does he deal with principle? Now is principle also an aspect of love? Because he's doing it because of his love for his wife perhaps? Or his love for God? I think sometimes in our understanding of loving God, we have failed to understand the place of principle and the place of that mental appreciation. I think we have focused on, the, on one side of it too much and it has caused us to be unbalanced in how we have dealt with God. Now, <clears throat> notice what Jesus said. True love is something that involves the heart. What else? The mind, the soul, and strength. 
These are four different things. Four different aspects of a person. Now, when you talk about love, true love, it, it must involve all four things because this is what Jesus says. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then because you are dealing with God, he goes further. He doesn't just say love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but what? What word did I miss out? No? Whole. Huh? Whole. Whole. Whole or all. Yeah, that's the word I missed out. All. Or the whole heart. In some places it says all, in some places it says whole. You shall love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That's the key to the door. Get that door open and your Christianity will work. Now, when you talk about the heart, I believe you are talking about feeling and emotion. At least the way we define heart today, right? When you get excited and emotional, where do you feel it? I think that's where the idea of the heart came from, right? I know that when I'm excited, my heart almost wants to tear out of my chest. It starts to beat hard, right? And so, the heart is seen as a seat of emotion and feeling, even though we know it's not really the physical heart. But I believe that the heart has to do with emotion and feeling. I believe the mind has to do with the mental appreciation. And I believe that between these two, mind and soul, you have, you have principle. What about strength? What about strength? What is strength? What does that have to do with? Huh? Your effort, strength has to do with behavior. Strength has to do with what you do, right Kelly? It has to do with what you do. Strength is not involved if you sit down and think. Strength is not involved if you have a feeling inside your bosom. Strength is what you do. There is one of the places we fall on to. Do we love God in our minds and not in our behavior? How do you love God with your behavior? Do you think consciously about loving God with your behavior? What you speak, where you go, how you, how you, how you expend your, your time, your energy, your money. Do you love God in these ways? I realized something. I'm going to say something that's not related to my sermon, but I was thinking about it the other day and it hit me. I want Jesus in my life all the time. I do. Maybe I don't always live it but I do and in the mornings when I get up to pray man I tell you sometimes I feel his presence and I feel like today I'm going to take on the world but when I when the day begins I lose that sense of commitment and I'm going to tell you why it's because my strength is not brought into the formula I'm loving him with my soul and my mind and sometimes with my heart, but my strength is not being brought into it. Do you realize that your work every day, the things that you do, ought to be worship? Do you realize that when you're cutting the grass, fixing the, the pipe with the marlon, washing the dishes, do you realize that you ought to be worshiping? You are doing this for the Lord and with the Lord. Do you realize that every act can become a sacred act of worship if you approach it the right way? If you approach it for love? Like I said here some time ago, I can remember. Those of you who, are, who have, a, have, a, have a relationship where you are freshly in love, you can know the truth of what I'm saying. When you are attracted to somebody, look here, when you go to the person, yard, anything that is there to be done, you're going to do it. It doesn't matter to you. They tell you to clean up garbage, cut the yard, wash dishes. From the person is nearby, you will do anything and there's no problem. You won't even remember what you do. You are so absorbed in the person's presence. The privilege of being there, the chance to be near the person, the job don't mean anything at all. You know what I'm talking about. I know because I've been there. So, serving God with your strength, your strength, or loving God with your strength is a part of the formula. It's the whole being that needs to be brought into this experience of affection for God. Now another question I want to ask, is this love, let me put two words on the board. <clears throat> is, this word in, is this love induced or is it produced? 
You English students, I hope you know the difference. You young people who got all your ones and twos in English. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. I should ask one of you to tell me the difference between induced and produced. But I won't. <clears throat> when something is induced, what does that suggest? Huh? It's natural, it's produced in you by some cause. Right? You don't, you don't have to try to do this thing. But there's some cause that takes place and it brings about this result in you. Is the love of God induced or is it produced? Either or either or both. What does it mean now to be produced? Produced is when you make an effort. You are involved in doing the thing, right? Do you make an effort to love God or does the love of God, love for God, spring up automatically because of a certain cause? Those who say both, congratulations, you're on my wavelength. Now, again, it's important because sometimes I, have, I know I have emphasized this and I have not emphasized this enough. Me. I'm blaming myself because I know some of you have done it too, but I'm not blaming you. I'm, I'm pointing the finger here. Sometimes I have emphasized the induced love and not the other one. Let's see some verses that talk about love being induced. Luke 7 and verse 42. <coughs> Luke 7 and verse 42. You should read it even if I'm not calling on you. It says, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? The one that is forgiven the most, right? Now, is that love produced or induced? Induced. induced. It's, a, it's a consequence, it's a result that springs up in the person's heart because of what? Because of? Because of appreciation for something somebody did for you, right? Somebody did something for you and you appreciate it. So this response springs up in your heart. You love the person. And that's exactly what the Bible says about our relationship to God. 1 John 4 and verse 19. We don't even need to go there. We love Him why? We love Him because He first loved us. Never forget that. So if you don't love him, what is the reason? Huh? Thank you. I'm glad you didn't say it's because he didn't love us. It's because we don't know that he loved us. Right? So, young people, if you don't feel a love for God that makes you want to obey God, it's because you don't know that God loves you. You hear that Jesus died on the cross? You don't understand what that means. You hear that God gave his son, you don't understand. You need to understand what this means, that it might break your heart and bring a response of love. Love might be induced in you by the knowledge of what happened. That is always the reason why a person does not give his heart to God or does not want to give his heart to God. I never wanted to become a Christian until I didn't find out about what Jesus did for me. That's not it. But I found out that God loved me. If I had not found out that God loved me, I would never have become a Christian. I'd have continued like a dog, chasing the world and its pleasures, maybe even until today. Maybe I'd be broken and sick, full of disease and, and filthy argument and behavior. But I would have continued because if I had not found out that God loved me, the thing that drew me, when I discovered that God loved me so much, I'd tell you something. I wanted to know Him. I wanted to be his friend. Why wouldn't I want to be a friend of somebody who loved me so much? Who was only seeking my good? This morning I was praying and I was thinking how people sometimes misunderstand me. And sometimes I lose my friends. Because they don't understand me and maybe it's my fault. But you know the thing that, that touched me when I was praying? I was saying, you always understand me. And I felt that a warm thing just burst up in my breast. I have a friend who always understands. Somebody that... Is not confused by my behavior. Somebody that is not, is not misunderstanding me. He knows everything and he loves me still. It was nice when I thought about it. To have this person for my friend. And that's what happens to us. 
brothers and sisters, when we understand the love that God has, it produces, it induces love in us. <coughs> now, love begets love, and that's a principle. He first loved us. But the verse we read at the beginning also teaches us that love is something that is produced. Because what does the verse say? The one we read at the beginning. What does it say? The first one. Thou shalt love. What does that mean? It's a command. Whether you feel the feeling or not. Whether you feel that sense of gratitude or not. You can come to your senses and say. I need God. And I need a relationship with God. So you now choose to love God. Can you choose this? Huh? You can't make blood out of stone. You can't make yourself feel happy and joyful out of nothing. If you don't understand what God did for you, you may not feel this. You may not understand it properly and so the mental appreciation is not there. But the other part of it, you can, you can develop a principle that I'm going to do what? I'm going to choose to give him my strength. I'm going to choose to devote my mind to him. You can make that decision and love can be produced in this sense. Now, I agree. If you don't have the Holy Spirit working in you, it's not going to be possible. But I'm talking to people who I believe have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you have the potential, you have the power, you have the ability to do what God asks you to do. Now, I want us to look at the balance in the Bible. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Alright, all of you are so faithful in looking for the verse. Fine, I wanted to see that. I appreciate that. So, so Tina, please read that for me. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. How many things become new? Oh. Now if everything becomes new, all things become new and you have become a new creature. Why do you have to think about loving God? Isn't that something natural that is induced in you when you are the new creation? That's the emphasis I've always placed. And it's true, but I realize that you need to consider the other side of it too. Jesus says, thou shalt love. Jesus states it like a command, doesn't he? Both things need to be balanced. The love of God in us is the love for God in us is both induced, but it needs our input. It needs our input, otherwise Jesus would not have said it. And I think this is where my experience has come short to some extent. And I say my experience because I know I'm talking for many of us, right? Well, God bless those of you that it doesn't apply to. I'm talking to those that it applies to. And yet even though we know that we are in Christ and we are a new creature, is it true that we are still buffeted by carnal desires and temptations? Is it true? Right, I want you to think. I don't want you to, 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 to expose yourself. I want you to think. Because these are the issues that I want to address. These are the things I want us to look at. Because Christianity, you know, Brother Emerd was reading about Gandhi. And I, I heard that Gandhi made a statement. I don't know if he was a hypocrite or what. Well, maybe he didn't understand Christianity. But Gandhi said, I like their Christ, but I don't like their Christians. Right? And then we were reading the story. He was reading the story this morning about how Gandhi went into this church in South Africa. And he didn't like what he saw there among Christians. Like it was just a, a social thing. And I'm looking at all of us this morning and I'm wondering... Is this Christianity for us? Come sit down every Sabbath and listen and go back home and that's it until next week. And you know, brothers and sisters, how the world encroaches on us and we find ourselves doing things we don't want to do. From the way we dress, mostly the ladies have this problem, but the men have their problems, right? They have a different kind of problem. Right? We with our computers or whatever it is. We allow 
The way and the thinking of the world to impact upon us is only when we come to church, and, and sometimes not even when we come to church. You can look at us when we come to church and see that the world is encroaching upon us, and we can't help ourselves, we can't fight it. We study the most beautiful things, and they don't apply to our lives, our strengths. We're not serving God with our behavior, with our mind. Sometimes with our emotions, you sing a song and tears run down somebody's face. Or, or, or they give a testimony and everybody wants to cry. Emotions. But the strength and the principle are not applied. I want to show you something. I'm going to come to it in a moment. But I want to, to just write some things on the board. I, I, when I get to it, you, I, you'll see more clearly what I'm saying. It is possible, brothers and sisters, it is possible to be born of the Spirit and yet live in a carnal way. I'm going to make this statement and I'm going to prove it to you. The work of the Spirit in a person, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, is an ability God gives us. It's not a compulsion. Listen to this. When God makes you a new creature, creation, are you compelled to believe like a new creature? Yes. Huh? It happens automatically. All right, I'm going to show you something here. It does, but there is a condition. Go to Galatians 5 and let's read verse 6. Read that for me, please, um, Kelly. Galatians 5 and verse 6. No. 6? Read verse 5. All right, I, I think I need verse 16. Try verse 16. This I say then, Thank you. Thank you. My fault, I'm sorry. Walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Who is this verse speaking to? Christians are worldly. So, if a Christian does not walk in the spirit, what will happen? He will fulfill the desires of the flesh. He will live a carnal life. He will live a carnal life. It is possible to be born of the spirit and to be a new creature and live like a dog. Read verse 25 of the same chapter, Janik. We live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Hey! If we live in the Spirit, we must what? Walk. So suppose we live in the Spirit and we don't walk in the Spirit. Is that possible? Huh? It's possible, otherwise Paul wouldn't tell you to, to do it. Yeah, you, you can be born of the Spirit and you can still walk in the flesh. Because living in the Spirit is a choice. Walking in the Spirit is a choice. I believe the place of choice is something that we need to emphasize more. This is like a... It was like a revelation to me when I began to look at this. Not a revelation. It was like something that needed to be emphasized more that I had not been emphasizing. Because there is a reason why you know all the truth and it is not working. And it's not God's fault. What, you think God don't give you what you need? Do we think that God lets us down? God gives us all these promises and leaves us hanging and then he doesn't do what it takes to, to get us across the line? You know, many Christians are sitting down waiting for God to do something else when God is waiting for them to just accept what he says and to choose the right thing. Um, go to 1 Corinthians 3. I didn't want to read this one, but I think probably I should. Britannia, can you read that for me, please? I'm coming to you. Send it. <laughs> First Corinthians 3, and we'll read verses 1 to 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are not yet carnal, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now who is he talking to? Christians. Christians. 
These are people that Paul carried the gospel to. I believe that Paul laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit, and these were born again people, right? Paul says, I can't speak to you as unto spiritual people. I have to speak to you as unto carnal people. Carnal meaning what? In the flesh, right? And he says, I can't feed you with anything more than milk. These are Christians. Maybe he, if he came to Albion congregation, he might have to say something like this, because look what he says next. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and behaving like men? What? You're not supposed to behave like men? Huh? No, you're not supposed to behave like men. You're supposed to behave like what? Like Christ. You're supposed to behave like angels. You are in the kingdom. The Spirit of God is in you. You are born again. You're not supposed to behave like men or women. But you are carnal and walking as men, even though you are born of the Spirit. There is something that is required of humanity, brothers and sisters. Something to make this formula work. So what? Is it to go back to the struggle then and go back and fight with myself and fight with the law? No, if this is true, there is no difference between the old and the new covenant. But we have to accept some things. This is true, I am in Christ. Every person here who is a Christian and who has received the Holy Spirit, you are in Christ. Two, you are in the kingdom. Three, you are a new creation. We have to accept these facts. Now the question is, how do we experience these truths? I'm going to, to try to put a diagram on the board that I'm going to go through. And probably by the time we finish discussing this diagram, I might have come to the end of my presentation for today. All right, I'm going to write, I'm going to illustrate three kinds of people on the board. First one, second one, third one. Now this first person is, um, is dead in sin. This first person, second person, is awakened. And I would say, by the law. This third person is born of the Spirit. Now this person, of course, is carnal. Would you agree? Fleshly. Living for the world. What about this one? Huh? Carnal also, of course. What about this one? Spiritual. Alright, good. I have you with me. Now notice there are three kinds of people. And I believe everybody in here is in one of these groups. Okay? Everybody in here is one of these, in one of these groups. It's for us to decide which group we fall into. Now the first person is dead in sin. That means this person is unawakened and has no interest in spiritual things. Now, maybe I should draw a line so we can follow more easily. Alright? This person has emotions. Do you agree? And has feelings. How about this one? Same? What about this one? <laughs> now, is this person sometimes happy? 
Sometimes sad. Sometimes angry. What about this one? What about this one? So, if this is the level on which you operate, there's no difference between these three, three persons, right? Yes. If you are depending on your feelings and your emotions to determine how you behave as a born of the spirit person, you will be no different from a carnal person. You are operating on the same level, the same basis. This is a poor basis on which to build your life. These come and these go. Let some of these ladies tell you about when hormones take them and the feelings that take them. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're miserable, sometimes they're cheerful. It goes and comes with the hormones. Can you live your life on the basis of, of feelings and emotions? Can you live your basis on the basis of whether this brother talk to you or this one show your bad face? You're going to live your life on that basis? If that is true, I can make you or break you. You're trying to be a Christian, I know how to mash up your Christianity. I just come and say something, the wrong thing to you. And man, down you go. So, we cannot as Christians operate on this basis. We all are on the same level playing field when it comes to feelings and emotions. Now what is the principle that drives this life? The principle that drives this life? Self-love. Self Driven by the principle of self-love. This means that everything this person does is based on what will benefit me. If you even find a mother doing something for her child over there, she will do it for her child, not for yours. Or if she does it for your child, it's because there's some advantage to her. Everything that this person does is driven by self-love. And these emotions come and go depending on how self is pleased or served. What about this one who is awakened by the law? What is it that drives him? <coughs> huh? Alright, fear is in there too, but fear is also a consequence of self-love. I think it's the same self-love that drives him. He's awakened, but he's not free. Do you see that? This person is awakened. He has heard the trumpet blown, but he's not free. He's aware that something is wrong. What has, what has awakened him? Mount Sinai. With his lightnings and thunders awaken him. And he trembles and he fears because he sees that he's heading for destruction. But he is helpless. He is in Romans chapter 7. Okay? What is it that drives this one who is born of the Spirit? Huh? What principle drives him? Huh? Love. In fact, I want to put the right, the right word, so I say selfless love. In other words, this person, born of the Spirit, his attention is turned away from himself. It's turned towards God, and because of his love for God, it's driving him to, 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 to behave, because he loves God. The Christian does not behave because of feelings and emotions, he behaves because he loves God. I want us to understand it, because I want to ask you, what has your love for God driven you to do today, or have you been following your feelings and emotions? Did it, did, did, did it spring from... What mood you felt in when you got up out of your bed this morning? I was a principle of love for God. Determining what you did today. The next thing is this one has no desire to do good. You might see them on the street, you might hear them on the roadside, and the, the nasty words in their mouth. Yes. And the, the unkind things they say, and the way they behave, and you think, how could human beings behave like that? Don't be surprised, because unawakened by the Spirit of God, they cannot do otherwise. Hmm. Unawakened by the Spirit of God, they cannot do otherwise. There is no desire to do good 
in, 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 in the person who is outside of Christ. And in fact, the Bible says of them, there is none righteous. What? No, no, no. no not one. There's none righteous. <laughs> what about the person who is in number two, awakened by the law? Thank you. He desires to do good. So a change has taken place, right? How is it put in Romans 7? In my mind, I do what? Yeah. I, 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 I have a desire to do good in my mind, but I find another law in my members that makes me a slave. So this person is awakened. Apart, we come to on the fourth on the third thing, the fourth thing here. Let me put an arrow here to show that this person has moved from here to here. What is it that moves a person from here to here? Let me say it's conscience. It's a response, the conscience responds to the law, and you move from here to here. Right? So those of you who have a conscience and you hear the word of God and you hear the law of God. You're awakened to think, I need to change. I need to do better. So you move to here. You are still driven by love of self, but you now have a desire to do good. But you still cannot do it, right? <coughs> what about the person over here? Well, even before you come to does good, he desires to do good. Just the same. He has the same desire, right? You have the mind that loves good that you got from Christ. But the next step over here this person is powerless to what? Powerless to do good? What about the one under the law? Powerless. I, 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 I hope I have enough space to write everything here. He's also powerless to do good. What about this one? Huh? Empowered to do good. All right, let me ask you something. I need to put this in. I'm going to come back to it. You move from dead in sin to awakened because your conscience responds to the word of God, right? Or to the law. How do you move from awakened by the law to born of the spirit? By what process? Understanding the love of God. Something more key. I'm looking for the word faith. Somebody said faith. You move from here to here by believing the truth. What is the truth? God has made you in Christ a new creation. You believe what God has done for you in Christ. And when you believe it, you move from here to here. You move from dead in sin. You receive the, the, the life of Jesus Christ by faith. Isn't that what the Bible says? Faith is a step from here to here. So Jenny, if you believe the word of God, you don't have to stay here. You can be here, desiring to do good and empowered to do good. But even then, that's not quite the end of the story. Let's go on to something else that is equally important. So, the behavior of this person over here who is powerless to do good, his behavior is always evil. Let me say, his behavior is always selfish. I don't even think I need to put this in because we already put it up here, right? Let me move on to the next thing. Here you have a harmony between the, the, the desire and the behavior. Desire equal behavior. Kind of cutting it short to make this, it work on this space, you know? Over here, what do you have here? Desire, what? That's a symbol for not equal to. 
equal sign of the cross. Desire not equal to behavior. Okay. And over here, what? Desire equal to behavior. All right, I think we can basically be finished with our diagram. Almost. Right. Here, you are equal to here. Your desire and your behavior are, this, are, are, are equal. But over here, your desire is only evil. So your behavior is only evil. Over here, your desire is only good, and your behavior is only good. To be in the middle is the most miserable place to be, don't it? Because you want, and you can't. You want to do good, but you are driven by self-love. You are powerless to do good, because this is what drives you. The love that is in you, it's driving you, it's, it's determining how you behave, and you can't move beyond self-love. This is a real thing. It's a principle that drives your life, that determines what you are. What principle drives your life? And this principle of selfless love comes when you are born of the Spirit. Because what does it say in Romans 5 and verse 5? Read that for me, somebody. You go back to the middle. Absolutely. Romans 5.5. 5. Um, I, I promised Cindy that she would read next. So read that for me, please, Cindy. And holy and not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by what? Born of the Spirit, the love of God is shed in your, our hearts. And then our life begins to be lived on that basis. But outside of that experience, all that drives us is self-love. We are driven by this principle of self-love and it dominates and controls our life. Look here. It takes something to humble yourself when you know that people are against you. Or you know that people are saying things against you. Or you know that you have something with somebody. It takes something. But I'm telling you. It takes something because you are driven by self-love. When you are driven by the principle of selfless love and you don't matter. It's not only possible, it's a reality. The, the great obstacle in the life is this. It's the great obstacle and it's the great thing that the cross must deal with. The cross is a place where self dies and Jesus enters the planet. The cross is the door by which Jesus steps into this world. It's the place where you die and Jesus lives. To take the cross means you have come to the place where you have given yourself to God, that he's able to give you the new birth, and you die to self. And Jesus comes alive. Now, even though this diagram appears to be, to be finished, I have to put something else on it to make it complete. There's an aspect of it that is not mentioned that I have to touch on. And this is the point of what I've been trying to say. You have the principle of selfless love. You have the desire to do good. Something needs to come into the formula that is not coming into the formula. Right at about this point. Something needs to come in here. I wonder if anybody can tell me what you think it is. You have the spiritual life. You are, you are governed by the principle of selfless love. You desire to do good. That's where everybody in here is. Okay, am I right? I don't know, but I think so. You are spiritual. All of us have emotions and feelings, so I leave that out. You are, led, you are directed, you are driven by the principle of selfless love. You have a desire to do good. It's not working. Why? You're alive. Huh? You're alive. The will, surrender. I'm going to use another word that means basically the same thing. You need to choose. You need to choose to act. Why? What is it that drives your choice? There's something that drives your choice. And it's not just your, it's not your emotions and feelings. What is it that drives your choice? It's the principle of love. Remember what we had on the board at the beginning? Emotion, principle, strength. What is it that drives you from that your, your desires become 
action, your strength comes into play. The strength that is in you from Jesus comes into play in your life. You go out there, you are sharing the gospel. You are doing good to those that hate you. You are loving your enemies. You are thinking every day, how can you help other people? What is it that drives you? It's the principle of love. It's the same thing why Brother Peter goes to work and when he works and he gets money, he comes home and he spends his money and buys something for Janet. What? Sometimes they vex and he still do it. Right? It's the same reason why you harass your poor mother and your mother still spends all her money to send you to school and provide for you. And even when you, 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 you disrespect her, she still provides for you. Why? Why don't she chase you through the door and tell you, get out and don't come back? If she follows her emotions and feelings, that's what she will do. But what is she operating from? Principle of selfless love. So it's not, it's not to do with how you feel, it's to do with what you choose. Do you love God? If you love God, forget the emotions and feelings and deal with that principle of selfless love. Choose to do what he says you must do. That's the missing element. We have the power. We have the motivation. We have the desire. We must choose. Because if you don't choose, you go right back here. The same thing that took you here will take you back here. Unbelief. You don't believe in the love of God. You don't believe that you are the new creation. You're ending back up over here. That's why we're struggling and fighting so much. We are here even though we are supposed to be here. We live in the spirit, but we don't walk in the spirit. We're born again, but we're not choosing to live the born again life. Because we are waiting for emotions and feelings to be right. Look here, if we're in falling... If people are attacking you, are chastising you, if it is right to go out there and share the gospel, go from principle. Don't wait till you feel like it. You will never move, or you'll move hard today and tomorrow you're sleeping. You can't work like that. The principle, the principle that we see in the Bible, where you think that Paul is made of stone. He's not made of stone. He just takes the cross every day and makes the right choice every day regardless of how he feels every day and so the will of God is done in him and it becomes easier as you learn to make those choices it becomes easier it becomes habit yes but but we can't start there we have to start with accepting the principle of love and letting that be the dominating determining force in our lives if we could do this brothers and sisters you become invincible Nothing can stop you when you have a mind that understands this. It's the key to the impotence of man. Experience the omnipotence of God. It's the key. God has already given us everything. Everything. When I look back at it and I ask myself, what am I lacking? He gave me the power, right? Did he give you? If you're not, if you're not born of the Spirit, fine. Don't answer. He gave us the power. He motivated us because when we saw Jesus dying, our hearts were stirred. He motivated us by telling us we are in the kingdom. We are sons of the kingdom. We are, we are born of the spirit. We are his children. We are motivated. One thing he cannot do for us is choose. We make the wrong choices because we are waiting for emotion and feeling instead of understanding principle principle is what the principle of love all your heart yes but also soul and mind and finally that will be demonstrated in our strength our strength when we operate from the principle of love and we choose because of that principle of love it will be demonstrated in the strength in the lives that we live the things that we do i will behave towards brother Durbin in a way that He's amazed because it's not human behavior. We are still behaving like men because we are not choosing the principle of selfless love which we have already been given. We need to believe the truth and stop living over here by unbelief. This is where the struggle is. This is where the battering is. Anytime you're struggling and battering, you are here. And we struggle and batter because we give ourselves the option 
to do something else. That's why we struggle and battle. I realize that. Even this morning I was talking to the Lord about it. It was coming clearer to my mind. Why do I sin? Because I make it possible for me to sin. I accept the possibility that I can sin. I accept that David is still David. David has sinned so many times. If I see myself and understand myself to be, in, to be David, this is where I am. Struggling not to be here and hoping to be here. No! God has put us here. Believe the truth. Accept it. I mean, it don't feel like doing the will of God. Curse the devil as a liar and do it because you are enabled and empowered. You just have to make the truth. That's all. Jesus has given us two, two commandments, basically. Two great... If, if you ask yourself, what does Jesus want me to do? Give me one of them, please. Love God and love man. Give me the other one. And it's related. No. We already covered that, man. He said, love God and love man. So don't tell me about that anymore. No, we got that already. Huh? I wasn't thinking of that. I'm thinking you get up this morning and you want to please God. And you want to do what God wants you to do. Okay, he says, love God and love man. Fine. You're going to do that. But he, he was more specific in another way about telling us what we are here for. What is your job? Huh? No, that's your lifestyle. Love God and love your neighbor. That's your lifestyle. What is your job? Huh? Okay, maybe I'm not keeping the question right. I was thinking of Matthew 24 verse 14. <laughs> He says, go ye into all the world. Go ye therefore. No, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. I was thinking of yeah. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you love him, it's a mandate that he has given you. You don't need to ask, what am I to do? You know, every day you get up, I'm to love God and love my neighbor. I'm to find a way to bless Chanel. I'm to find a way to bless Brother Marlon. Everybody who crosses my step, I'm to find a way to bless that person. I'm to love the person, not just with my emotions and feelings, but with my strength. I must do something. Love that is not acted out. Marsha. It's just a nice word. Love that is not acted out is just a nice word. It's just a sentiment. And it doesn't help. The wicked do the same. So principle... That results in behavior. Is what Jesus wants. And he has told us what our behavior should be. In our day to day activity. Every person that we meet. We must love. We must bless. And in relation to our God. Every day that you get up. You have this task before you. Go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. You don't have any reason to say no. You don't know what you must do. Okay. Whichever school or college you girls going to. Don't you forget it. You have two tasks before you to love your schoolmates and to preach the gospel. Okay. I hope you don't forget. Because I'm certainly going to keep it before our minds, before mine, and before the older ones of us. Now, maybe this evening we'll talk about it a little bit more. I'm going to stop here now at this point because it's one o'clock. And I'm hoping that what I said today was clear enough that we understand. I'm going to ask you, is there anybody here who didn't get the point that I'm trying to make this morning? Put up your hand and tell me, and I'll go back over the main point. Anybody? Man, that's wonderful. It's a good feeling to know that I can ask a question like this and nobody puts up his hand. Not even Chanel. All right, thank you very much. We're going to sing, I think it's 252. My, I love thee, I love thee, I love thee, my Lord.